In this video, we'll explore how memory is managed and used in MS-DOS. If you are interested in this topic, please check out the other videos in my DOS series. Before we get started, I just want to establish some terminology. There are some versions of MS-DOS for non-IBM architectures. This video deals specifically with DOS running on the IBM 5150 architecture and its descendants and clones. This architecture is also known as PC or PC compatible, and I'll use those terms here. Also, the Intel 8086 CPU has a variant, the 8088. The 8088 is the CPU used in the IBM 5150. The 8086 and 8088 are equivalent for this discussion. For simplicity, I'll refer to this class of CPU as 8086. MS-DOS got its start as 86-DOS, written by Tim Patterson of Seattle Computer Products. Intel had launched its 8086 CPUs in 1978, and Seattle Computer Products needed an operating system for its 8086-based computer kits. 86-DOS was somewhat of a clone of the CPM operating system, except for the 8086 CPU. 86-DOS launched in 1980, and 86-DOS and Tim Patterson were both procured by Microsoft after that launch. The rebranded MS-DOS product was initially released in 1981. DOS was originally designed around the memory model of the 8086 CPU. The 8086 has a 20-bit address bus, meaning that it can address up to 1 megabyte of memory. The cost of memory continued to fall rapidly during the 8086's life cycle. The 8086's successor, the 8286, launched in 1982. It boasted a 24-bit address bus, increasing the addressable limit from 1 megabyte to 16 megabytes. The 8386, launched in 1985, further expanded the address space to 32 bits, a flat 4 gigabyte model. The 286 and later x86 processors guaranteed full backwards compatibility. This meant that software developed on them would run on previous x86 CPUs all the way back to the 8086. To do this, the 286 and later processors start in a mode that behaves just like the 8086 and carries its 1 megabyte address space limitation. This compatibility mode is called real mode. The programmer can then use software controls to switch the given CPU to protected mode. In protected mode, the full functionality of the CPU is available at the cost of backwards compatibility. Because DOS, like the x86 processor line, would continue to provide backwards compatibility all the way back to the 8086, it starts and runs primarily in real mode, having a fundamental limit of 1 megabyte of memory. On 286 and later processors, DOS has numerous ways to overcome that limit. The IBM 5150 architecture and its descendants are the primary hardware platform for MS-DOS. The 5150 was designed around the 8086's 1 megabyte address space. Let's see how that area is allocated. The first 640K is mostly base and optional RAM, although the bottom 1K or so is occupied by BIOS. 640K is the maximum here. The original 5150 had as little as 16K RAM and a maximum of 64K. 128K is reserved for video registers and video memory. 192K is reserved for BIOS expansion ROM. This is where any expansion card would make its ROM or RAM accessible. And the top 64K is used by the motherboard's BIOS ROM and the basic interpreter, if there is one. In short, up to roughly the first 640K of addressable memory is RAM available for use by programs, programs like an operating system. Now that we have this system memory map, let's see how DOS fits on top of this as a real mode application. There's a terminology to refer to different areas of the PC address space as is viewed by DOS. Conventional memory, also known as base memory, is the first 640K of the address space. Low memory is the first 64K of conventional memory. DOS loads itself into conventional memory right after what's used by the BIOS. 
Whatever device drivers are needed are loaded right above the DOS kernel. All the space that's left is available for user programs. The second 384K is the upper memory area, or UMA. As we've seen, this is where the system hardware is mapped. It's not RAM, so it can't normally be used by DOS or user programs. Conventional memory and upper memory total the first one megabyte of memory. This is the entire address space of the 8086 CPU. High memory is the first 65,520 bytes above the first one megabyte of memory. This area is inaccessible by DOS running on 8086 CPUs, but can be used on 286s and higher. When accessible, it's used by later versions of DOS to load the DOS kernel and map the BIOS. Extended memory is all memory above one megabyte in a machine with a 286 CPU or higher. Except for the high memory area, extended memory isn't directly accessible in real mode. Also, it was some time after the 286 launched that large amounts of extended memory were widely available in PC configurations and much software was written to take advantage of it. So in the beginning, this left us with a maximum of 640K, the conventional memory space, to run our software. Some of that would be necessarily occupied by DOS. As more popular peripherals launched with device drivers and software became more demanding, conventional memory became a scarce resource. But as CPUs improved and larger amounts of memory became common, tools were developed to let DOS take advantage of the advancements. Since the 8086 could address up to 1 megabyte of total memory, that could hypothetically be up to 1 megabyte of RAM. The 640K limitation was imposed by the PC architecture. This is because the 384K upper memory area was reserved for other parts of the system. Clever methods were developed to reclaim some of that address space for program use. In DOS parlance, this is called expanded memory. It's a system of bank switching RAM into parts of the UMA. It was first done using hardware expansion cards and chipsets, and later simulated completely in software expanded memory managers like QEMM and EMM386. So how did expanded memory work if the entire UMA was reserved? It worked because any particular hardware configuration probably wouldn't use all the UMA. For example, the 128K video reservation accounted for different graphics modes, but any one graphics card was unlikely to need all of them at once. And 160K was reserved for all the expansion cards IBM anticipated the user might use, whether the user actually had them or not. If the address space was free to use for expansions, then extra RAM was just as legitimate as an expansion as anything else. As expanded memory became popular, DOS added support for putting device drivers and TSRs into parts of RAM accessible in the UMA. This freed up conventional memory for user programs. Expanded memory was a useful stopgap measure, but ultimately memory became cheap and plentiful. There's no point in squeezing as much as possible out of the first megabyte of address space if tens of megabytes or even some gigabytes are available. This brings us to extended memory. Extended memory is all the memory above one megabyte in a machine with a 286 or higher CPU. Except for the 64K high memory area, extended memory isn't directly accessible by programs running in real mode. When using DOS, extended memory can be accessed indirectly through a programming interface called Extended Memory Specification, or XMS. XMS provides direct real mode access to high memory, allowing for executable code and data storage in that area. XMS also defined a method of mapping RAM inside the UMA range. These mapped areas are called upper memory blocks, or UMBs. UMBs can be used for data storage, but not executable code. UMBs may sound a bit like expanded memory, and there is a relationship between XMS and expanded memory. The DOS expanded memory driver is actually responsible for managing UMBs. The most common DOS XMS driver is HiMem.sys, first included in DOS 5.0. 
Since HiMem.sys allows access to high memory, a 286 or higher CPU is required to use it. With HiMem.sys loaded, user programs can store data but not execute code in extended memory. HiMem.sys also allows much of the DOS kernel to load in high memory with the config.sys DOS equals high option. XMS gives real mode programs a way to access extended memory indirectly with limitations. Protected mode removes these limitations on extended memory access, so the real way forward would be for programs to run in protected mode. But how could protected mode programs run in a real mode operating system like DOS? This was made possible by the development of DOS extenders. A DOS extender is a program running on DOS that enables other programs to run in a protected mode environment even though DOS itself runs in real mode. The program using the extender is none the wiser about what's happening between the extender and DOS. DOS extenders give programs an interface for using protected mode while handling the translation to the underlying real mode DOS kernel and back. The DOS protected mode interface, or DPMI specification, grew out of the development of Microsoft's Windows operating system. DPMI quickly became the major interface implemented by DOS extenders. Extenders quickly became crucial to meet the ever-growing memory needs of business applications and games. Expanded memory, XMS, and DOS extenders gave us incremental improvements to breaking the 640K conventional memory barrier in DOS. And they did so while maintaining backwards compatibility with the 8086 CPU. But Microsoft's ultimate solution was to deprecate DOS and its real mode support in favor of Windows. Later versions of Windows 3.1 and Windows 95 required a 386 or higher CPU. Programmers developing for Windows 95 or later could use 32-bit protected mode programming interfaces instead of 16-bit real mode ones. The legacy address space limitations were gone and programs could directly address hundreds of megabytes of RAM. I hope you've enjoyed this video on the origins and evolution of memory management in DOS. If you are interested in IBM PC compatible architecture and programming x86 processors on DOS, please check out the other videos on my channel for more on this topic. And if you liked this video, I'll see you on the next one. Thanks for watching.